to introduce Reed Pai, who is an amazing part of our community, and, and just told me that I was announcing Reed. But it's really an honor because I feel like he comes to everything, all of the student events, even outside of his own Welcome to today's afternoon, Friday afternoon lecture, end of the week. Um, and my topic, this is the Dharma Poetics Week, in case you have not heard. And um, my topic has to do with that subject. And I thought in thinking about it that what I could try to do, since I've <coughs> spent a lot of years here, um, one way or another, different ways, um, is to try to tell you how I feel um, about Dharma poetics, <laughs> or what I think it is, what I think it points at. And I do so with the disclaimer that I'm not attempting to define it in any kind of a final way, or establish a new school of poetics. Why not? <laughs> um, why not? Well, that's a question at the, for the end. <clears throat> but at least this is not my intention. So because I think one can sound like that one's proselytizing for uh, a fixed belief system, and that tends to turn the atmosphere down. So, and, and here's the other reason, is that um, these principles that I feel apply and have come from this idea don't um, want to be focused or narrowed into one kind of writing or one school defined. I think they're good for any kind. They, they, work, they could work whatever you're doing, is my view. So, Joanne Kiger, uh, at the beginning of this week, the first presentation of the week, defined dharma, the word dharma, in a very clear way, even though that word, as she let us know, is multiple in its uh, connotations and denotations of meaning. There is a root syllable to it that Giovannina reminded me of, dur, the D-H-R, I guess, from the Sanskrit, which, um, Giovannini, you said, is basically what it is. Is that so? Like we say that, what it is. What something is. So it's trying to get simple and down to earth about things. And it's pointing to, in doing that, pointing to the tendency we have to get complicated and off the earth about things. So it may be suggesting there are ways to come back down to earth and, do, and to see and hear things directly and, and then notice simultaneously our tendency to add on to them, to um, edit and interpret and uh, recontextualize very quickly. So, Dharma means something like being as it is, the being of something as it is, but also the other side is to experience the being of something as it is. That's what we could try to work with um, and maybe help out clarify situations thereby. So seeing, hearing, feeling something free of uh, projections and free of conceptual addings on to it, at least for a while, at least um, so that we did feel that thing in a way that felt like it was what it is. 
So the word truth kind of suggests itself here, something as it is. But as Anne mentioned yesterday, um, truth is never here exactly to be to become a name or a label. It's hidden. And as um, Norman Fisher pointed out in his talk this week, when, something that really um, was very, I felt, succinct and provocative and clear when he said, as, as space, space is the truth of visual form. So we're all seeing things right now. The truth of those forms is space. And as space is the truth of visual form, so silence is the truth of sound. I'm not going to try to unpack that any further, but I think it's there's two good hinged principles there because so much of our time is spent seeing and hearing things. And this, as I think I have understood it, is the fundamental poetic transmission of the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. Again, as I have experienced it. And once that transmission is received, then there's the sense that your writing can know what it's doing, even if the writer does not. So you can, there, there are ways of dropping beneath your own radar, and, um, and things happen there. So one, I've taught this class called Contemplative Poetics over the years, and it was requested by students, I always say, so that people, again, don't think in my paranoid way, that it's, the people don't think that I'm trying to um, invent and pass on a, a, a set of true principles. But there is curiosity about this, I think, in all of us. And there's also resistance, I know, and um, all of that. So, but, but uh, one student, in my, the last time I taught this in the fall, said, confessed in the first class that she was taking the class with some trepidation because she imagined that all semester we would be writing about a leaf, <laughs> being a contemplative poetics class. That would be what you do in a class like that. You take a, a simple object and then that's all you just look at it and write about it. So I think you know from the range of presentations of the kinds of writing and approaches to writing that you've ex experienced even in these two weeks that um, writing about a leaf is not really what we're getting to ultimately. Though, who knows, maybe it's all in that leaf too. So the history of this school has unfolded under a conviction that whether the content of an act of writing concerns a leaf or is self-witnessing the uh, felt onslaught of psychological wounds, engaging complex, troubled social conditions disturbing the air and the feeling that you're willing to go there, touch that, engage, uh, invent and take on a conceptual writing project, or simply get involved in trying to turn language inside out in one way or another, even if you don't particularly know why you, do, you, you feel that impulse. Any, any and all of those and everything in between can be taken on with um, this kind of dropping down into it sense of touching things directly. And that probably 
whichever kind of project you're taking on, it, what, it will be the fresher and better for that. that you, this is, goes back to the old cliche of getting out of one's own way. So there are uh, methods of, of um, it's not that easy to do this, so this can all sound like more ideas and theory, but there is a sense underneath that it's, you have to, we have to do more than that, because we can't just hear an idea, adhere to the idea, and then do anything more than have another idea for a while. But if the idea seems to be about the possibility of getting beneath uh, operating solely in the realm of ideas, but more in the realm of touching things, being willing to touch things and have them touch us, that you at the door, from Anne's uh, roomy talk yesterday, when you come to the door, I mean, when the person at the door is you and sees themselves that way, then, then another realm opens up. So meditation practice, for instance, is one, one way that's been recommended and, and established for really doing this as opposed to just considering it intellectually. There, in, over time, one meets oneself uh, directly in all, it's all our infinite aspects. And maybe some people, some people may not need that kind of practice to get there, but I know I have and do, and I've benefited a lot by that. So this points to an aspect of Dharma poetics which I will call presence, being with whatever it is you're experiencing and being interested in being there willing to be there, even if it's a painful and delicate and difficult place to stay and look. The, we do talk about lineage and tradition here, as if um, when the school was established, certain uh, um, certain profound notions of how one approaches art um, were recognized and acknowledged from the past and seem to be um, compatible, consistent, and ins inspirational for, for continuing the, the, those approaches. And even though the, those lineages aren't identifiable as one stream or one um, canon of writers and works, we gradually come to feel together, I think, the affinities um, and through each other, through hearing about different writers. It's, it's a continuously embellishing and then um, uh, growing lineage. An affinity, though, with poetics of the past and present where there's a similar kind of interest in getting real about experience and its connection to language and writing. It's, um, so we can't give that lineage a name even, but, and it's many branched and many um, sourced, uh, what we call it experimental sometimes. Outright. Anne calls it outrider and has a few acolytes there. <laughs> um, so that's one name, outrider. Yeah, that's an important name that's been given. And, um, but even, even more broadly, because I don't know that all through the past it's always been outriders So uh, I like Denise Levertov's term exploratory, myself, exploratory poetics, 
because of the implication that you go into things rather than just dabble. kind of writing which she says incorporates and reveals the process of thinking, feeling, feeling, thinking, rather than focusing more exclusively on its results. So we're into it, we go into it, and we explore there, and at that point we don't know what the result will be. And that's part of the uncertainty and that's part of the realness of it. So in this approach to writing, poetic content does not behave so much as a topic out there, discussed or considered by a subject here, but instead reveals present movement of the mind itself, including sense perceptions, argumentative logic, torqued or straight grammar, wild hair, thought, splicings, restrained or outrageous emotional allegations, the feel of words, parts of words, all of that in, in itself, in and of itself. Could we have the first quotation? Oh, is this the first? So this is a quotation. I'm not, I didn't put the people who said these things up there, just because that tends to be an initial lock of the eye and mind. To create is to conceive an object in its fleeting moment, in its absence. To do this, we simply compare its facets and dwell lightly, negligently, upon their multiplicity. We conjure up a sense of lovely, evanescent intersecting of forms. That's a kind of, uh, it seems like a fairly subtle butterfly-like kind of landing place to, to touch in on. But it's from there that this lovely intersecting evanescent sense of forms, plural, moving, can be accessed, apprehended, felt. So as I, again, part of this is very concerned with language itself, and as that, that's a very deep and broad discussion, as you know, but here, in a word, I think language is understood as a self-creating function of mind. Not simply a system of naming and categorizing communicative symbols and signs, but a self-making process that we as humans have a quite sophisticated uh, handle on, or a built or reservoir of. And one becomes aware and even more curious about the intimate relation between moments of experience and how they turn toward or into language. I think something like this is where that happens. <coughs> so mind moves, it could be said, in sort of thought sparks of something that's almost words, but not yet words, and then finds words. Do these proto or pre-language sparks arrive within or outside of any apparent context as they go? Do we need context for that to happen? 
which comes first? And then a big question, how can they be incorporated in what you're doing, what you're making, without jumping to a, a kind of crystallization of idea too quickly? So in a Dharma poetics, the mind and the phenomena of the mind engages, breathe together as the maker. And one of the teachings on how to work with this, maybe very abstract notion, um, is through some of the practices many of you have done and, and, and that are have been given this week, I'm sure, in very different ways by different faculty uh, that have to do with, um, first of all, a sense of being on the ground, because without that, uh, the whole thing can spin anywhere and get more and more ethereal. But with a sense of ground, body, presence, the earth, then that openness of possibility can be felt from a point of view that's, that, can, that can keep its perspective on that openness, not get lost entirely in it, and know what to do with what comes up there, know how to make a decision there, or make a selection and what and when not to, when to leave one. So this this is a, one of the ways that Chogyam Trungpa spoke of this was taken from the um, Chinese and Japanese traditions, which mixed um, Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism even into um, a. a a way of considering art or any action that includes both heaven, a sense of openness, limitless openness and possibility, unmanifest, and earth, the feeling of being here for a moment, touching something real momentarily, and then together being willing to be in between those two things. And that being in between just means you're holding both at the same time and you're informed by both at the same time. And what happens then is a spark from one to the other. You are conducting. The heaven principle, he says, is connected with non-thought or vision. It's just basic space in which you have no idea what you're going to do. Then, as you look at your canvas or your notepad, you come up with a first thought of some kind. Something occurs, which you timidly try out, he says. And the slogan, first thought, best thought, comes from this moment. You've opened to space as uncertain as that is. Something's occurred and you've noticed it. That's the first thought. And that's the best thought, he says. The third principle is called human. The human principle confirms the original panic of the heaven principle and first thought, best thought of the earth principle to put together. At that moment, you realize you have something concrete to present. So there's the aspect of vision here. <clears throat> and so 
so there's a sense of presence as an aspect, an important sense of aspect of Dharma poetics, and there's also a sense of vision that's an important aspect of Dharma poetics. Vision, again, I think meaning that you have placed yourself in between the realms of complete openness and complete precision in terms of noticing what's happening. And then being there, you're up, you're fine. You can do it there. We have the second quote. You can recognize the song without a name, probably. And spirit turned unto the dust, old friend, thou knowest me. And time went out to tell the news and met eternity. And spirit turned unto the dust, old friend, thou knowest me. And time went out to tell the news and met eternity. So I, I, that's the heaven, earth, and human happening together. And the news is what you've got to tell at that moment. We have the next quotation. Eternity is in love with the productions of time. <coughs> so they're not two different worlds, heaven and earth, and human, or three different worlds. They're all like Robert Spellman's image of they're somewhere in a back room making love privately. <clears throat> the author? Yeah. That's William Blake. The other? the other was Emily Dickinson. And the first was <coughs> Stefan Mallarmé. Next one. This poetry is a picture, a graph of a mind moving, which is a world body being here and now, which is history and you. This poetry is a picture or a graph of a mind moving, which is a world body being here and now which is history and you. I want to ask if anybody can cross that or paraphrase it, clarify it. Does it hit anybody in a clear way? To come up to the mic and say so. It does. Be helpful because there's a lot of uh, intersection there. This is Philip Whalen. This says to me that the poem being produced in the moment and the poet producing the poem are the same. They're not divided here in the present uh, time and space. How about the world and history? Uh, it's it's when this when this moment happens, there's a natural uh, connection that opens up to to everything and to all time in the present. 
Good. <laughs> that sounds good. And it, it sort of links back to the, again, the initial panel this week where I think every panelist seemed to, where that, where that discussion seemed to settle was on this just recognized fact of any tradition of the interdependence of everything. So it, it, the, uh, as soon as this happens, it's, you're plugged into uh, the infinite set of relations among things and beings. Okay, I'm going to stop soon so we can have questions, but there are a few more quotes. Can we have one, the next one? It is such a simple yet subtle art, this saying things in time. It is such a simple yet subtle art, this saying things in time. So everybody, um, if you can, take your one hand and place it on your wrist so that you can feel your pulse. And just feel that pulse. So that's an expression, a natural expression of time. We have this space which can look sort of static. But that feeling, we can feel time and we can hear time as well. So the art of poetry is very much about um, drawing attention in measured ways to the experience of time. Another thing that uh, one other principle here is uh, well based upon the Blake quote: "Eternity being in love with the productions of time." The image there is of space wanting. time to be productive. <coughs> and so there's a lot of subtlety involved in different, all kinds of different ways of creating measures in time. Some can be large and Latent, some can be very intricate and delicate and changeable quickly. You just have to do often what, what we call the line in a poem or the sentence in prose. They are all measures. And just as a little aside there, because over the years we've had prose and poetry um, debates <laughs> here at Naropa, just to be clear, the, the term poetics, in my mind, and I think uh, should, in everyone's mind, be the way that it used to be, which is it, include, it includes uh, all these arts. It's not a one genre or mode of writing versus another. Poetry, as you know, comes from the word to make. It doesn't even have to deal with language only. Is anything made? Is a, is a poem, well, etymologically. So prose, and this is another, um, I have another quote from Mallarmé, who is a great precursor figure to this view, if you haven't read his essays. 
Um, oh, I guess I dropped it out because I wanted to keep the, the uh, talk shorter. But his, I, his sense is there's no such thing um, as verse outside of prose, that every sentence is composed in the same way a poem is, by measures. So this sense of sound or beat, measurement of time, takes place just as importantly and as much in prose writing as it does in a poem. There's no need to make any distinction there, I don't think. So this, this is now, we're talking about presence and vision. This is now how they ride in time rather than just the idea that might be con connoted that well, once, you, once you're there, nothing moves. You're in some kind of an eternal stasis. No, nope. it continues to move. And how to stay on top of time as it moves with is a sense of vision, a sense of presence. is poetry. Okay, can we have the next quotation? If the movement is lively enough, perhaps it is possible to know that it is moving, even if it is not moving against anything. If the movement is lively enough, perhaps it is possible to know that it is moving even if it is not moving against anything. This, this is the idea of being inside of the act of writing as opposed to the one doing it. Again, riding time, from internally riding time with a sense of vision and presence. This is Gertrude Stein, and this is her practice, is to write in the act of writing. The attention is inside the time of the writing. Nothing's held outside of that time. And this is why she's challenging to read herself. Okay, next quote. I speak of the verb process, the doing, the coming into being, the at the time of, contemplating the artifact as it arrives, listening to it emerge. There it is, and there. I speak of the verb process, the doing, the coming into being, the at the time of, contemplating the artifact, artifact as it arrives, listening to it emerge. There it is, and there. Mary Baraka. So a Dharma poetics has as its subject the intelligence exploring its own nature within the space and arrival of present experience where things open up to themselves there and there. So the discovery happens momentarily Nobody is outside of it as it happens. It's opening to itself. <coughs> this is um, what I, why I think the word exploratory is a good one. And I'm not promoting this as a good word, but I, why I think <coughs> Levertov's term exploratory poetics for this this kind of attention in language and thought is a good one because there's a definite sense of going into and being there and moving on 
So, um, there's one more aspect besides presence and vision and time, vision and time um, include together, presence, vision and time. Um, that's a very important quality to Dharma poetics and the poetics as I've experienced it here in Europa over all these years. Um, and Anne touched on it very passionately yesterday, as she always does, and always will, I hope. Um, and it has to do with why, why we, why we do this. That's just a question. There's no single answer to it. It's different for all of us. But within the history of this place, as I've experienced it, it has a lot to do with the nature, another quality of the nature of being inside that joining of space and now and moving from there. And it's related to the notion of how interdependent everything is at that point. That includes you as a notion that arises in connection to other notions, me. And somehow, in that realm of experience, there's a lot of warmth. I don't know why, but it seems to be the nature of it. To, to go into things means you open up to things, you open up to yourself. All of that suddenly becomes very moving. And you have a lot of uh, feel for others doing the same thing or not doing that. This is so, so it's important to consider the inherentness of this part of Dharma poetics. Not, that it's not necessarily something we add on, or it's, it sounds like, you know, the, the community aspect should think of this too, but to consider it as inherent, the connection to others that arise, that, that's aroused and arises. It can be, um, can be very sad, as we've experienced. It can, it can arouse deep, deep sadness. And we shouldn't be afraid of it. Too afraid of it. And, of course, great joy at the same time, even. And I think, I'm thinking of the panel um, Uh, also, oh, who was that the opening panel? Joanne and Laylee and Lovace, is that right? So the way that went, having talking about things as they are, the connection between language and things as they are, the, the recognition that language holds so much of who we are, it's not just our dangerous toy, as Anselm Hollow called it. It's culture's medium. It's our lineage medium, our cultural history, and it can be lost. It can be taken away. And it can also bind us as um, Claudia Rankine said the week before, um, race is a way of binding us to this world, one of the infinite ways. All these ways were grouped 
by virtue of being uh, arising in these bodies when we did, and <coughs> the place we did, the time we did. So, recognizing that all these phenomena are interdependent, they are vast and endless, and they are all ultimately moments of experience. That's all they ever were. All of that at once gives great energy and power to any moment seen as it is, heard as it is, unembellished. Straight shot of this. And then, um, from what I took again as the, the powerful inspiration of the beginning of this school, which, and I was, I maybe, uh, I was not part of that in any way, but as a raw young student. But the um, the clear, clear connection to. Uh, a spirit of helping out the situation by this means, which was not, it's not obvious, it's not always put together that way, that there's some way this can help this world, it was uh, overwhelming <laughs> for me. Sorry, but this is like, the, this is your life moment. <laughs> um, and still is listening to, uh, to the reading of Kaddish outside and, and the, you know, the, the way people come here, the way, as if they knew where they were coming all along. <laughs> they see Carmen holding this weekly event in between the cracks here. It's just, you know, more and even more of more. <laughs> And how and how often the, the um, you know how often it's to me that there are these lines of um, coincidence, remarkable coincidence between one panel and the next, or spirit of the week. And a lot of this is Anne's intuition on how to, how she puts this together. But but also things happen from that level that are really um, not planned, obviously. So. Um, so there's a compassion aspect to this too. There's the presence, there's the uh, visionary, and the time, and the compassion that, that are all, as far as I know, again, are inherent inside of something we're calling at least this week Dharma politics. I think we have a couple more quotes, just to finish on that note. From Great Consciousness Vision, Harlem, 1948, buildings standing in eternity, I realized the entire universe was manifestation of one mind. My teacher was William Blake, my life work poesy, transmitting that spontaneous awareness to mankind. That's Alan, and that's such a force here still. I think we all feel it in some way, whether or not, you know, however you respond to it. But it is, <laughs> it was a, a forming um, commitment, a vow of some kind and from Alan and and also, I think, from the, from the founder of Europa, Truman Trumpa. So, I will stop there and then see if you have any further discussion on this. Please come up and ask me a question.
easy reference point for this whole idea because of the way we're here doing one thing and then go out and come back and something entirely different set up. But that's that in itself, the space of this room and what arises in it um, is just a good, uh, it's not exactly a metaphor because it's the real experience, but an example of this, what I've been trying to say about space and things arising in it and relating to that directly. Would you agree? Incredibly short one for the other five. Um, <laughs> so, Reed, I had a question um, concerning your contemplative, your contemplative engagement with music um, and how working with, say, the added instrument of guitar, how working with sound in that way, um, how that differs from poetry or how it does not, um, and what your experience is in. So you're writing a song as opposed to writing a poem. Like, how do things arise in music in ways that they might not um, in poetry? Because I do play music, so I don't know that they do or don't necessarily, but I would love to get your thoughts on that. OK, I'll try to say something simple, because I don't have much, I don't think, sophisticated to say about that. But it's a question of attraction, really, I think. Just what, you're, what you feel attracted toward um, and it's a bodily-based attraction, clearly. You know, the, the, the sense of beat. I think how a regular, does a regular beat get you going? Ignite um, your body, mind, things. And I think it does for everybody, but it may not be where you're interested in exploring compositionally. But it is fun to do. They're, you know, it's very lively and it's um, very immediate, like a child's attraction to the rhythm. And then when you also throw in language on it, the stakes go up for how you, how you can present it. Because you don't want, the language can't drop into the predictability of that beat pattern. So this is really, the, you know, what we're talking about is metered verse versus free verse, you could say, on a basic level. When, meter, when, when meters were controlling as they all, all, I mean, for most of history did and for most of cultures do, have a palpable beat systems uh, for their poetry and song. And that the language then has to find a relationship with those beats that's more than just uh, imitating its, its, the beat pattern with the syllable beat pattern. Because that, is, that becomes uh, monotonous and predictable. So that means you've got a double system happening. It's very interesting to play with and very good practice to work with, even if this is not your mode. Because then you get a level of phrasing, word phrasing, verbal phrasing, which has its own musical qualities, but they're more open-ended and less regular, on top of or married into a uh, regular beat pattern. So you want, then they, the, the ideal is that they can come and go, go away from and come back to with that, with that underlying meter or beat pattern. So you get two things going, and by doing that, um, meaning is complicated, especially when you add rhyme, really, because the rhymed words have now a auditory and neuromuscular relation to each other that complicates the, the semantic relation between them. And they land in a particular place together, you know, in time. So they, the production of time becomes um, really what that's all about, time producing uh, shapes. But I, you know, that's, that's what I would say in a short version, thank you. Uh, I'm Eleanor Arkin yes. for the archives. Um, so my question, comment, concern is about um, the event of, 
I mean, and I can only like talk about it in examples of like this room being the perfect um, example of this like dharma poetic that you're talking about and how it's it's not um, a metaphor, it's not a comparison, it's a collision. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak um, towards like how you would define is the not right word. Um, maybe put like some walls up around it, make a little house about it. I'm not sure what the it is yet. The, the it is is that uh, collision when you're trying to talk about something and it's happening. Ah, uh, that's the thing we can't talk about. Oh, okay. No, we can, <laughs> we can talk about it, but there's, it's, it's only so far you can go talking about it. Because it, 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 so you want to be careful that you do, really don't want to know the answer to that. You wouldn't want to have the answer to that. And B is fine because there isn't one you might get exactly. So, so up there, um, in fact, I don't think I caught, just because I was in a tenor for a second, uh, who it was from, uh, but it really intrigued me, it is such a simple yet uh, subtle art, the same things in time. Um, what struck me about it a little bit, this is just kind of my thoughts, preceding a question, I guess, uh, doing my best here, um, um, that it's such a challenge to really be present and when writing to try to get things down but at the same time to embrace that I don't know what's going on, that, that there's so much confusion and there's so much there's so many blank spots in my vision in fact. And I think that it's such a challenge to be humble enough to to bring that forward in in, in the writing, in the vision. Am I in any way close to 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 the, to what this quote is referring to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are lots of ways, probably. Um, one is the, the 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 need to the need for a focal point of some kind at that moment, and so we don't. There's all that stuff happening that you just named: the confusion, the um, you know the. Well, leave it at confusion, including it all, I guess. But, but then, what do you? So, where do you, where do you go? What do you touch? What's the? What's? What can? What, is it, Is there an event emerging from there that you could, if 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 you could, if you could escape the confusion for a second, that you could touch? And I think the cue in the quote you're talking about might be um, something moving. You, you, you find something moving, something that feels like it just ended or is about to begin. Um, because this confusion is the static part, it's like everything just died or, uh, you know, the, the space lost its pulse. So you go into, you, you, this is a dare, you know, it's a risk in a way, at that moment. Um, you go, you have to go, you can't, you can't undo the confusion exactly, take it off. You have to go inside there, and then something happens, because it was just space to begin with. But it does take the, the uh, gesture of going into it, stepping into it. And, and uh, the art, then, is to be able to stay there, to, to be able to um, keep doing that, I think. Stay on it. And then, like Kerouac said, 
mind is shapely, art is shapely, that can be trusted. There's a, there's a native sense of shape that will start to uh, move through all these interdependent phenomena. There will be some line of movement. That's, the, that's why it's exploratory. We, we don't need to do that, crank that up so much. It's getting into the exploration that wants to take place from that point of noticing something on. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope this isn't all too gassy and abstract. Uh, um, but if that's the case, I should hear about it. So please come up and I'm Charlie Epstein. Oh. Fun bar, okay? Oh. Excuse me. Um, no. This is a love poem for Read By. <laughs> read By, My Prospero, My Virgil, My Compassionate General, My Ginsberg, Teacher of Touching Things in Time, Intrigues, the Conceivers of this Fleeting Moment. So, I beckon you to continue to spark the minds of the world. Thank you. Beautiful, Charlie. Well, before this turns into a now, um, Sentimental love fest. <laughs> Remember, this is a, this has got to be on the on the dock. So we, we're always on the spot and on the dock with this kind of attention. Um, any other questions? That was Creeley, by the way. The um, art and time. Yeah. We're talking about Eleanor, and I don't know the other person's name. Was that described so much, so many of the classes we have here? <laughs> <laughs> and especially um, a class so unique to Europa that's the online tree space awareness class. Because the challenge there is that I find for most students it's so hard to write about the experience as it's happening. And to catch. How can you do it? You can't write about it as it's happening. You can't, yeah, express it. You can't catch it because it's moving. It's moving so fast, yeah. or seemingly is moving fast until one gets to experience the space in between the movement. I just wanted to express how much I really appreciated what those because I. Um, <laughs> I, know I know what it takes. It, it's hard. It's so really yeah. hard. <laughs> you find yourself, um, you know, getting really uh, <clears throat> troubled in, with prepositions in this kind of exploration because, you know, whether something is of or in or, you know, the, it, it shifts. But so the, but the, the, the notion is, can one be inside of uh, attention as it's moving, with nothing held back, observing or talking about it? That's the documentation of uh, you know, what is a moving present attention that we all possess, and it discovers things. It's not, um, it doesn't really need it more than itself to discover and investigate and come to uh, momentary glimpses of understanding and expression. Um, I guess my question is about that kind of 
moment. It really, it's about this whole um, process of the summer program as we get kind of barraged with so much, so many different perspectives and so much kind of like new information coming to us. And like for me, it's been a really hard thing to write, to be in that moment, to be able to yeah. write. And when there's when there's so much going on, like sometimes someone can maybe enlighten you or like it has that spark. And you can go from that. But um, with so much happening, I guess the question is how do you find time to write? Hmm. Does anybody have this answer? Anybody <laughs> discovered the answer? Less sleep. Sleep less, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's you know, if this is just the case of that there's a there's a, a spectrum of activity and not and less activity, more and less activity that we're always involved with changes, and um, we need to feel like we can have some uh, degree of control over the more and lessness of it. And less isn't always so good either, but. This is a concentrated period, clearly. And if you can, uh, I, well, maybe I would say the inspiration from what I, where I'm coming from with this talk would be to uh, recognize that just like the question about Janelle's question about the confusion, uh, you could possibly treat all that activity as space too at a given moment, and and therefore be less caught by it than, you know, surfing it, or something like that. And then, there, then there's that fact of surfing it being um, a way to, a, a, an immediate way to be, re, to be in, in the moment, you know, in the, to be present. So, yeah, that's, I think that's all I would say. Hi, Chris Campbell, Archive Archive. Uh, I've been thinking about Q's metaphor that she shared in her talk last week about the woman on the moving train and how that affects observation and it sort of seemed like an apt metaphor for what you're talking about. And then I got a chance to talk to her a little more about that after writing about it. And she said, oh, think about Howard Sins. Um, I think it's been converted into a movie that you can't be neutral on a moving train. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that inability to be neutral is what pushes us to create something in the first place once you realize that you're. So I'm putting that out there to sort of just extend. Thank you. Do you want to unfold it anymore mm -hmm. as, you, as you have the mic? <laughs> sure. As I'm Huddling it like a you know crooner, yeah. um, so I'm gonna move with it. Uh, but, um, I was in Paris. He loves that. So, uh, the uh, the landscape, sort of outside of the train, you know, is the world that we're observing, and then ourselves and maybe other people that are on the train as people in the present moment. But I'm still exploring, you know what it could mean, but it's very useful to think about documentary poetics. I think it's maybe useful for this conversation. Yeah, I think I would just say in an obvious way that the illusion that we're static observers of anything and not moving at all points is um, an illusion. <laughs> but we can, so we can know that and then um, uh, Um, step into the fact of the movement, so that and, and, and the person you can't have one foot on the platform and, as the train goes off. Hi, hi, uh, Jason Hardy Burks, Fridays. Um, uh, your talk really resonated with me and my writing practice. And I just wanted to 
offer um, this to you as well as everyone as a way to think about how to uh, inhabit this space in writing. And for me, I know a lot of people know this, but for me working with Banu Kapil and Michael Franklin in, in um, clay practice, Michael Franklin says that one of the beautiful things about working with clay is that when you put your finger into clay and you take it away, the clay tells you what you've done and it shows you where you've been. Um, and I think that if you can kind of um, see that dialogue between you and your artistic practice, bring that into your writing space, know that you're, you're doing the same thing, that the writing is a type of clay, um, then you can kind of maybe um, sustain or, or, or be more um, aware of what's emerging. So for me, in my own vocabulary, emergent poetics, which is I think what Amiri Baraka was talking about, uh, is helpful for me. Could you, could you define it a little bit for us? Um, I mean, you, your whole lecture was uh, emergent poetics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 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 sitting with your with your writing and um, see tracking what is emerging um, in that space and not necessarily forcing it into um, avenues because you expect X, Y, or Z, but rather you let the writing lead you the work. Good, thank you. Okay, I don't see anybody else coming up. Maybe we should have time to stop, or can we have a few more minutes? Anybody here from the realm of the um, administration and authorities? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if there's anything, I, I feel like one, one border, one uh, border I've always felt um, on one side of with this material is that between its, its discussion um, and that of and the, the social action um, inclination, which has also been here all along, and is encouraged and cultivated and not seen as different. But I, I, I don't know, I think I should say this because it has been something I've noticed, and I don't want it to be the case, certainly, that um, this sounds like it's uh, kind of in, in an interior uh, interior uh, compulsion or uh, investigation that loses uh, awareness of all the many layers and levels of engagement that are going on within the interdependence of the phenomenal world, some of which are extremely sharp at a given, at a given point and need to be addressed uh, um, and cannot be turned or I don't know, cannot, must not um, be turned away from thinking so that I'm encasing myself in this notion of poetics to the exclusion of the experiences and, and um, circumstances that are sh sharp and painful or alive in, in the world around me. In other words, I, it's not an idea to hide out in this notion. But it seems to be like there's a, I see some nodding heads, and it seems as if there is a, an either-or kind of level, at least, where you do one or the other, and the other looks like it's um, ignoring the other. So I need to say that, um, and I don't know what more to say, but if, if you have anything on that, on that plane, of experience and relation to writing, I would be very grateful. Margaret. Margaret. <coughs> Sorry, Margaret Randall. Um, 
First of all, I just want to say that I was thrilled with your lecture. It was really helpful to me. And I didn't hear for a moment at any moment uh, in it, nor do I feel ever at Naropa that there is a, uh, a contradiction between uh, social activism and everything that you spoke about today. That's one of the most thrilling parts of Naropa to me. And it's one of the things that sets Naropa apart, or the experience here apart from many schools or many places where that seems, there seems to be a dichotomy there. And I see it as um, there's, when things work, when um, time space works, when we can place ourselves uh, on the moving train or you know, wherever it is for us that it works, when it works, uh, that is what finds things as they should be, justice. Um, so it's, it's the same if it's justice uh, for people who are in need of justice for whatever reason, and ourselves very much included, or if it's uh, justice in the way the poem is born, the pose is born, the creative act is born, um, it's, it's making it work, and to me that says it. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Good. Um, yeah, so the labels there maybe get in each other's way at times more than the, more than the underlying engagements. But the, um, some, you know. Okay, thank you all so much.